What is up everybody, Dak here, and today I'm going to be talking about how to choose an ideal sub for whatever project you require one for. So first off, I'm going to list the specs that every sub should include. If a sub doesn't have any of these specs, then just ignore it. So it's power handling, impedance, size, and brand. So power handling and impedance kind of go hand in hand, as they're both part of the power specs. Ignore max and PMPO values, just focus on RMS. RMS or roots mean squared power is what a sub should be able to do reliably as more and more music these days is kind of sinusoidal big tones rms is definitely what you want to be focusing on and pmp is completely ridiculous it's often 10 times it's rms and there's no way amplifiers can do pmpo power it's stupid uh, impedance is also important when choosing a sub as when you want to match a sub to an amplifier a 250 watt at 2 ohm amp is may be only capable of putting 125 watts into a 4 ohm sub. So you're only going to be seeing, seeing half the power that you possibly could. If you've got a sub that you need replacing, uh, impedance can be found using a multimeter. Though if the spec isn't listed online for uh, the impedance of a sub, just ignore it. If it's not listed, chances are the sub's blown and the seller doesn't actually know the impedance of the sub. Something else to remember when choosing the power handling for a sub is 2 times power is only 3 dB more. So if you want to go from 121 dB to 124 dB, you're going to go from 250 watts to 500 watts, not much return, which is why box design plays the biggest part in increasing output. Something else to remember for high power handling subs is your car electrical system needs to support it. So for example, a regular car power system can do about 1000 watt RMS pretty well, but any more than that, you'll probably need a second battery bigger alternator, maybe both. And another important factor is size. Might seem kind of obvious, which it kind of is, it's one of the basic specs, but you can only get a 12 inch sub to fit into a 12 inch box. So when replacing a sub, go for one which is the same size. Something else when choosing a sub for a box, bigger subs need much bigger boxes. So for this six inch sub, it's and a 12 inch sub, double diameter, four times surface area, eight times, the ideal volume is required. So even if you had four of these six inch subs to get the same surface area, they only need half the volume of the box. So big subs need much bigger boxes. This isn't the same for all subs though, but it's a pretty common trend. Something else is bigger subs are more efficient. They can move more air without having to move as far, less mechanical loss, more efficient, more sound, less power. And the same goes for multiple small subs. So two 6-inch subs will have 3 dB more efficient than a single 6-inch sub, even on the same amount of power. And if you count that you've got two subs, that's 6 dB more power. Well, that's 6 dB louder. Now another pretty obvious one is brands. Go for brands which have a good reputation, which can handle their RMS power, and often companies that say their subs can handle 1500 watts and everyone runs them at 3000 watts RMS, that's a good brand. That's something to look for. Something Sundown Audio often does, and they've got a good reputation, good enough one, that they can sell subs without having to put huge RMS power handlings on them. I also like to go for companies that list tons of specs on their subs, so you know exactly what they're going to do in simulation software. It also means that they know their products more. They're not just buying parts in bulk, assembling them and selling them. They actually know what's going on. So custom tool parts are a good indicator that it's a good brand. Though often companies might not list specs for their top of the line subs as they sometimes do them custom per order. So if you need a sub with a certain spec, they can do it for you, which is why they don't list it. But yeah, check out reviews and YouTube videos of whichever sub you have been looked for to see what people think of them and to see if they can handle more power than they actually say in the box. And now we're going to be talking about some more involved things, less obvious things. FS or resonance frequency, linear XMAX, efficiency bandwidth product, this one right here which is very important when choosing a sub, and also SPL which isn't so important but it's a commonly listed spec and I'll do a bit of debunking on this one. So first off the FS or the resonance frequency of a sub. Stiff light subs have higher resonances and soft heavy subs have low resonances. The lower a sub's resonance the better it can play low frequencies and this is particularly important when designing a box for things like very deep music or home theatre, which is where you want the rumbling lows, you want a sub with a low FS. Portery enclosure shouldn't really be tuned below the FS of the driver, 
as often below the FS the driver can lose a bit of control and can possibly overexert itself causing damage. And often resonance frequency of a driver decreases with age as it just naturally becomes softer. Some other subs can break in where for the first 20 hours of play they're a bit stiffer than they will end up being and yeah this is just referred to as break-in which is where the FS goes lower quite quickly and then stays steady. Now Xmax is another spec which isn't well known often people count Xmax as the absolute maximum a speaker can move but it's actually just its maximum one-way linear excursion. So what that means is it's the furthest a speaker can move while creating a proper sine wave. It's measured between the distance of the voice call gap and the top of the voice call. So this distance right here is the one-way X max. When a driver gets to a point like here, it's reached its maximum excursion linear. And as a sub starts to move even further, which it can do, its motor strength starts to decrease, which means it can't push as hard which means it's not linear anymore and it kind of rounds off the top of the wave. High power subs, of course, need more excursion. They move more with more power, which means they need longer voice calls. And when you've got a longer voice call, the less the voice call in the gap, the less efficient it is. So what more powerful subs need is bigger magnets to increase the strength of that small gap, which is why often when you see a high excursion sub, a good indicator is it's got a huge magnet on the back of it. Just because a sub has huge surrounds on it doesn't mean it's capable of a ton of excursion. If it's only got a standard magnet, then that standard magnet is going to be the limiting factor of its excursion much before the surround is. Surrounds only play a part in maximum excursion when they're really small. Sometimes the sub can actually start to stretch the surround and that can affect how linear it is. And as I mentioned before, important factor, EBP, efficiency bandwidth product. Now EBP is crucial when choosing a sub. If you want a sealed sub or a ported sub, depending on if you want sound quality or compactness or maximum output and a flat frequency response, then this is the equation you want to see right here. EBP isn't often listed on the sub's spec sheet, but it's very easy to calculate. If you've got the FS of the driver and the QES of a driver, then you can run this equation right here. For example, if a sub's got an FS of 30 hertz and a QES of 0.5, it has an EBP of 60, which is about here on this diagram, which means it's more ideal for a sealed or fourth order bandpass, but it fits into the either or, so you can potentially use it in a big ported box. So anything here can be pretty well used either or, but off this end of the spectrum, just sealed or fourth order, and off this end, just ported or sixth order. So very important thing to remember, it might be a pain in the ass to have to go through and calculate the EBP for each sub you're having a look at, but it's worth it in the long run because it'll give you a good idea of the ideal box for your speaker. And now SPL, as I mentioned before, or sensitivity at one watt or 2.83 volts at one meter. This is USPL, by the way. Uh, it's commonly listed spec, but it's actually a TS parameter. It's not actually measured using a microphone. It can be measured, but it's only an indicator of how loud a sub is free air which means not in a box. Heavy stiff drivers, which are ideal for high SPL applications, for example, DB drag, often actually have low sensitivities. And the reason why, as you can see this equation right here, uh, VAS times FS cubed over QES, if the VAS goes from 80 liters for a regular sub to 20 liters for an SPL sub, then this number right here ends up being a quarter of the efficiency of the 80 litre sub, even though the only difference is the VAS. But of course they are in reality very good and very efficient, very loud, which is why this equation right here isn't really a good indicator of how good a sub is. Also it's the reason why PA subs have such high sensitivities, because this FS cubed here, the difference between 30 hertz resonance and 50 hertz resonance is a huge difference. In fact, just off the top of my head, it's about 10 times more efficient just by going from 30 to 50, something like that. And the way you get the SPL sensitivity is you put whatever number you get here into this equation right here. And here are more useful specs that you should look at when looking at a sub. VAS and QTS, which are crucial in box simulations. 
BL, which is important for SPL guys, and MMS, which is kind of more important for SQL guys. VAS, or equivalent air volume, is essentially if you've got a sub with a 50 litre VAS, 12 inch sub with a 50 litre VAS, it has the same feeling diaphragm, as in the same amount of force pushing back, as if you have a 50 litre box with a 12 inch cutout, and a soft diaphragm with a diameter of 12 inches stretched over it. When you push it in, it'll feel the same as this sub right here. Hence why it's called equivalent air volume, or volume of the air, or volume of air suspension, whatever that one is. Uh, VAS is super useful for working out the volume of a sealed box. For a sub with a QTS of 0.5, the VAS is its ideal sealed volume. That's just a quick way of looking at it. But for any subs below 0.5 QTS, the ideal volume of a sealed box is going to be lower than the VAS. Most drivers tend to be lower than 0.5 QTS. So for most applications, a ported box is bigger than the VAS and a sealed box is lower than the VAS. Something else to note too is speakers can have the same resonances and different VASs. Stiff, Heavy drivers have the same resonance as light, soft drivers, but these can have different VASs. This will have a lower VAS than this one here, which means this is more optimized for a smaller box and a higher power handling, whereas this one's for a bigger box and a low power handling. And QTS, another very important spec. Now, right off the bat, I'd suggest that you go for a QTS between 0.35 and 0.5. Anything below that need really small boxes and anything above that need really big boxes. But yeah, QTS is very important when simulating boxes. If you go into a program and want to see that how smooth the frequency response is, you're going to need to put in the QTS of the driver. Subs with a QTS of above 0.5 and even 0.7 need very big boxes. Car door speakers often have QTS of around 0.7 because they're not really mounted into a box at all. 0.7 means the driver needs minimum damping by the enclosure. All the damping is done by the suspension itself, which is why they can be mounted free air. Subs with a QTS of below 0.3 are very peaky and are ideal for SPL or super small boxes. Now BL is an important spec for SPL guys, as higher BL means higher motor force factor. The more force a motor can put out, the more pressure it can put out, and the louder you're going to get. Pretty simple. BL naturally increases with impedance, which means the strongest motors are going to be high BL at low impedance. Well, these subs tend to have big neodymium magnets where the neodymium slugs are right next to the coil instead of channeling through a top plate. But small neodymium magnets are becoming common and pretty typically have the same BL as ferrite subs. They weigh a ton less, so they're easier to mount, more fuel economical, and take up less space. So neodymium magnets are pretty good. And last but not least, MMS. MMS is the moving mass for the speaker. Often a way people decrease the resonance of drivers and passive radiators in passive radiator subboxes is they add mass to the driver or the radiator by either small weights or just adding blue tack to the cone of the driver. Decreasing the resonance frequency by adding mass means they can play lower frequencies much better, but they can't play high frequencies quite as well. Something to keep in mind though is when you add mass to a driver, the sub can much more le easily read maximum excursion, which is why most low frequency subs have a ton of X max because they take into account that you can be playing them at low frequencies, high excursion. So when adding blue tack to a driver, in order to control the more excursion, you might need to put it in a smaller box, which can actually negatively affect how low you can play. It's a bit of a trade-off there. But just make sure that you put the mass on the driver evenly, so it doesn't push unevenly on the cone and distort it and the sub's not reaching too much excursion, and you can have your very own low resonance sub for home theatre for pretty cheap. So yeah, that just about covers the specs that I have a look at when choosing a driver. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos similar to it, uh, feel free to like and subscribe. And if you've got any questions uh, or just want to say anything, leave it in the comments below. 
But thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Also, leave a like. I just recorded this video, and my mic wasn't working for the whole thing. But anyway, thanks for watching.